When William Branham connected with W.E. Kidson, a whirlwind of events created the perfect storm. The success of Branham's revivals of the 1930s and early 1940s was limited by the small crowds in mostly rural churches. By 1946, he was holding healing revivals all across the United States. In the fall of 1946, W.E. Kidson launched a healing campaign that would quickly change William Branham from a small town preacher to an internationally recognized faith healer. When I thought about the prophet's early years as a faith healer in the message, I thought about the late 1947 and 1948 years. We were told that an angel gave him his gift of healing in May of 1947 and that the 1947 availability of the tape recorder was God's gift to the bride. There were only six recordings in 1947, five of them after November. When the prophet described getting new gadgets for recording in April, I just assumed they weren't needed until November. I never considered that they might be replacing old gadgets. The 1947 healing campaign trail began January 15th in Camden, Arkansas at the Apostolic Tabernacle. Nine back-to-back -back services were held. Six days later, the campaign made its way to Shreveport, Louisiana, in a city where Roy Davis, William Upshaw, and W.E. Kidson were already familiar faces. The prophet packed 2,000 people into Bird High School. Reporters were eager to interview those healed, but they were unable to find any who were actually cured. The prophet pronounced healing for those arriving in ambulances, but according to newspaper reporters, they left the meeting in those same ambulances. A blind woman was healed, yet remained blind. According to the reporters, promises of healing were accepted just as eagerly as an actual healing. They were only able to find one single person who even sounded remotely better, having stomach trouble and then later eating a hearty breakfast after being healed. The reporters had many opportunities to see a miracle performed. They were present as the prophet placed his hands on the sick and afflicted, but after watching the healed leave in the same condition they arrived, their reports were written with a very skeptical tone. One crippled woman tried to walk after being healed, but nearly fell to the ground when she tried to walk. A cancer patient in a cot was pronounced healed, but was back in the cot when he left for home. There were many who claimed their healing, but none were miraculously healed with a change in condition that was visible to the eye. Not a single person was actually healed in the meeting. Instead, they were sent home to claim their healing. Branham's next publicized meeting was in March in Santa Rosa, California. A week-long series of meetings was held at the Sunday afternoon clubhouse. By June, news spread through the Pentecostal assemblies throughout the United States and Canada. Pentecostals were expecting a move from God after the 1907 Azusa Street Revival and believed Branham's revivals held their answer to prayer. They placed spiritual significance on the 40 years from 1907 to 1947 and decided that William Branham's sudden fame 40 years later was destined by God. The number 40 is spiritually significant to some Christians. Pentecostal ministers started spreading the news that Pentecost was coming of age and announced that the prophet was coming to Canada. Shortly after the California meetings, the prophet held a healing revival in Vandalia, Illinois. Reporters, eager to find a healing to report, followed him to the meetings. From January to the end of June, they had seen many people listen to William Branham claim that they were healed, yet none of the severe cases showed any signs of miracle. Only a handful of slightly healed cases were reported that can be verified. They were questionable at best. One case of interest in the Vandalia meetings was Walter Beck, a boy nearly everyone that was present in the meetings recognized. 
The prophet would have never known that young Beck was familiar to the crowd when he pronounced him healed in the meeting. Walter Beck was severely injured in a horrific accident on December 6, 1938. The car of an oil field worker traveling at almost 80 miles per hour struck Beck, throwing him 125 feet in the air. Beck was rendered both deaf and mute and nearly died. Nine years later, in that Vandalia meeting, the prophet said that Beck was healed because he could utter the sound Dada. This caught the attention of former magician James Randi, who recognized some of the strategies that the prophet had used in his meetings. Randi noticed that they were similar to things that he did during his stage act as a magician. Randi had built a reputation exposing frauds during the spiritualist movement and was collecting similarities between faith healers and stage magicians that he would later publish in a book. When the well-recognized Beck wasn't healed, it presented quite a problem for William Branham, W.E. Kidson, and the Branham campaigns. Apparently, William Branham claimed that Beck wasn't healed because he smoked a cigarette after the meeting. A tactic I had earlier found was also used by F.F. F. Bosworth. Both the reporters and Randy knew that this wasn't much of an excuse for a man claiming to have been empowered with a gift from God to heal. Though the reporters present were unable to find any healed, they were able to find some people who witnessed healings in the meetings. Some said that an eight-year-old mute was healed and that she was able to speak a few words after her healing. Others said crossed eyes were straightened and deaf were made to hear. One Reverend Borer reported several cases of healing from abandoning crutches to cancer's quote-unquote falling out, but the reporters following the campaign trail were still unable to find any verifiable healing. Not a single first-hand account from a person who was actually healed could be located. Reporters continued attending the revivals, patiently waiting to report a miracle. In fact, they watched 1,100 of the 2,500 people in the meeting go through one of the healing lines. The revival, watched very closely by the reporters, ended without any visible miracle. I wondered, if someone was healed in the meeting, why didn't the person healed tell the reporters and offer proof to validate their claim? Even with the lack of verifiable healings, the excitement continued to grow and spread. Those who attended the healing revivals and witnessed people being pronounced healed were eager to tell others. From minister to minister, elder to elder, and church members to townspeople, news of this prophet from Jeffersonville, Indiana spread from coast to coast. Some people who attended the meetings did return claiming to be healed. One person claiming to be healed was Minister L. R. Mitchell's wife, who claimed to be cured of epilepsy and her name was used in the newspapers for advertisement. The paid newspaper advertisements, however, failed to mention those who left without healing. The advertisements were worded in such a way that it sounded like anyone could be healed, not just a handful of unverifiable cases. In August, the healing revival moved through Saskatoon, Canada. William Branham continued pronouncing healing on thousands of people. Saskatoon reporters were able to find people to testify of their healing, and suddenly it began to sound as if something miraculous was taking place. Mary Bruce claimed that she could speak better after the meeting. Another woman ate a regular meal after being healed of stomach trouble, and yet another claimed that she gained hearing in one deaf ear. In one of the meetings, William Branham claimed to have raised people from the dead in his hometown of Jeffersonville, Indiana, from the undertaker's parlor, causing a flurry of questions to the news media back home. There were so many questions that the Jeffersonville Evening News published an advertisement to set the record straight. In no uncertain terms, the Jeffersonville News rejected Branham's claim as false and denied ever having reported any such account. The Branham campaign organizers were very clever in their advertising. They used the number of people pronounced healed by William Branham, not the actual number of confirmed healings. Advertisements made statements like, 
35,000 cases of healing have been wrought. Jack Moore from Shreveport, Louisiana, helped promote the Branham campaign. By the end of August, the Prophet left Saskatoon and toured through Calgary. The Branham Revivals had attracted so much attention and gained such a large following that the campaign team rented the Victoria Pavilion exhibition grounds to hold all of the people. The revival had Calgary bursting at its seams. There were so many people that it was difficult to find hotels with vacancy. As the revival continued, the failed healing started to catch up with William Branham and his team. Mrs. Clyde Kidd, healed of tuberculosis, died in a Calgary hotel. Newspaper reporters decided to investigate and publish their findings. When questioned, William Branham denied praying for the woman, who said that he had healed her shortly before her death but taxi records confirmed her visit to the meetings, placing his denial in question. I found it odd when reading William Branham's response to the press. He said, I prayed for the sick individually at the pavilion and did not try to cure the audience in mass. I remembered several recordings where William Branham did pray for the audience after a healing line, and it was one of his common techniques. I was also surprised to find him using the words in mass, which was not a phrase that later versions of his Kentucky stage persona would have even known. All of the words used by William Branham during his early ministry were much different than the words which made up his later Kentucky English. After leaving Calgary, William Branham held meetings in St. Louis, Missouri. He teamed up with Little David Walker, a 13-year-old evangelist. They advertised signs, miracles, and wonders. In my opinion, the following he attracted were more focused on their ailments than they were upon the Bible. Matthew 16:4 described, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Yet William Branham's campaign advertisements used big, bold words claiming signs, wonders, or miracles. According to the advertisements, young David Walker preached the sermons and the prophet held prayer lines after the meetings. Reporters witnessed several people who showed visible signs of improvement, but not all were miracles. The vast majority of cures were people being told to leave and find healing later. In an interview, William Branham told reporters that most cures are of the quote-unquote gradual type, meaning the reason the reporters weren't able to find any people cured was because their healing was not instant. The article read, Most of the cures reported at the meetings were of the gradual type. Reverend Mr. Branham spent considerable time over the serious cases and announced in almost every case that the demon, or the spirit, which had been causing the illness and fled the afflicted body. He could tell this, he said, by the vibrations he felt in his hand and through a change in color of the hand. This was a side of the prophet's ministry that I'd never seen or heard before. We were told that people were instantly healed and that thousands of crutches were carried away from the meetings by truckloads. When I thought about his healing campaigns, I thought of getting the message out to the people. We were told that the healing was only to attract people to the message. Yet the boy preacher who traveled with William Branham was not old enough to know sound theology, and he was attracting people to the healing. He was giving the message during a sermon. It wasn't about the sermon. It was about the crowd. In early November, the revival continued to Phoenix, Arizona, where meetings were scheduled for eight Sundays straight. In the days between, William Branham held revivals as far away as Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. He would preach on Sunday at Phoenix, Arizona, and then spend Wednesday through Saturday back in Vancouver. He also held meetings in the surrounding areas of each event. While in Vancouver, he traveled over a hundred kilometers to Chilliwack, British Columbia for yet another series of revivals. Testimonies of healing continued to pour in, many of which were printed in local newspapers. But suddenly, newspaper reporters noticed something very unusual. Some of the people testifying that William Branham had healed them were repeats 
of previous healings. A crippled Helen Gledhill, for instance, entered the healing line and was told that the evil spirit was cast out from her. She was healed, but then returned to another meeting in a stretcher. Once again, she was healed, walking from the room. Her mother, Ethel Gledhill, claimed that the spirit came back and crippled her. She entered the November revival and was healed a second time. Her mother suffered from anemia and pneumonia and was confined to her home, unable to work. I wondered, was William Branham's campaign team paying the poor and needy to claim healing? I started to compile a list of newspaper advertisements for the meetings held by the Branham campaigns and compared it to the handful of sermons that we had access to hear. Just as I suspected, there were many, many sermons that we did not have access to hear. Also, as I suspected, many of them were before the new gadgets for recording. I knew that I would never find them all, yet I identified over 70 sermons preached in 1947, not even counting all the church invitations mentioned in the newspaper reports. That number also didn't count any of the meetings from the previous year of the same revival tour, which started in the fall of 1946. The wire tape recording was widely popular in the United States in 1946, but was also available for his 1945 meetings. Where were those recordings? As part of the prophet's income, I couldn't imagine them being lost or misplaced. They would have been recorded, mass-produced, and sold. The master copies of those sermons would have been kept under lock and key by the campaign team. It was yet another source of income. Were these sermons being removed to conceal healings discovered by news reporters? It was time to start investigating The Voice of Healing, the newspaper publishing company that William Branham created to advertise his own healing revival meetings. The publication seemed to be a critical part of the creation of his stage persona, yet in the message, we barely even discussed them. Many people had never seen a single issue. I thought to myself, maybe those issues held some clue as to why the early sermons were erased from existence. <laughs>